Professor Angie Hobbs, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, so you're a philosopher, and the book of yours that I've read and I've really enjoyed is called Plato and the Hero. Um, and the reason why I liked it, because I'm a, I'm a classics guy. That's what I studied in college. And um, sort of the idea of masculinity that we're trying to promote here on The Art of Manliness takes a lot of cues from the ancient Greeks, uh, the ancient Romans. And in the book, you argue that Plato was somewhat ambivalent about the Homeric values that had guided ancient Greece and that all of his works, the Republic, all the dialogues, were they, those were an attempt to temper or at least accommodate these sort of barbaric values um, to something more rational and refined. So before we get into the specifics of how, we, how he did this, let's talk about these Homeric values. Um, what were they and what did they look like in action? Yes, I'm, I'm not sure if barbaric is, is quite the right word, but, but certainly they uh, comprise a set of values which Plato thought needed to be interrogated. So the key quality that the Homeric male was striving to achieve was, was arater, excellence, and it combined intellectual, emotional and physical qualities. And for Homer and for many of the writers after him, before Plato's time, your excellence was very much uh, geared to your social role. It depended on whether you were male or female, whether you were a master or a slave, young or old, rich or poor, and so on. So gender, class, age are crucial to what kind of qualities and behaviors you should be exhibiting. And a, a really lovely um, summing up of this Homeric ethos we actually find in an early Platonic dialogue called the Mino, where one of the characters whom Socrates is interrogating, Mino himself, who's an aristocratic young man, and Socrates says to him, what is our tear? And, and Mino gives a Homeric response. And he says, oh, there's no difficulty about saying what our tear is. Um, if it's a man's arete you're after, that's knowing how to run his affairs capably and to stand up for himself and his family and uh, sort of ward off his enemies and support his friends. And if it's a woman's virtue you're after, that's in terms of running her house well and being obedient to her husband. So very gender and class uh, oriented. As we'll see later, Plato is going to hugely interrogate that. But that's the, the basic idea in Homer. And if you're a man in Homer, then it's really crucial that you fulfill your manly duty of being excellent on a battlefield. What will that involve? It'll involve physical strength, speed, skill at fighting, and of course, the kinds of qualities that make up what we would call courage. And the, some preeminent uh, Homeric heroes who display these qualities, Achilles would be one, Odysseus would be another. And again, we're going to find out how Plato interrogates uh, those role models and incorporates the best of him and discards what he regards as the worst of them. So there is this very strong notion of what it is to be a, quote, real man and preeminently you're going to be good at fighting you're going to be strong you're going to be skilled and you're going to be brave you you've got the homeric hero he's he's being brave homer uses various words for that um and absolutely key to whether you can be brave or not is whether you possess what homer calls thumos this is a really interesting word, and it has both physical and spiritual connotations. Initially, it appears to have meant the breath, uh, the breath viewed as a warm, moist vapor, which arises out of the boiling of the blood around your heart and lungs. But very quickly, this physical breath and this physical boiling of the blood come to be be seen as your life force, your metal, your uh, a, a certain spiritedness, which is absolutely requisite if you're going to be brave. 
So the Homeric hero, the brave, able, strong Homeric hero must have a very large quantity of this stuff called thumos, this, this breath, this life force, this raw drive or energy, which is going to power his effectiveness on the battlefield. And, th- I mean, how related to, to Thumos is uh, this concept of honor, or I think the Greek is time, time? Mm. Um, what role did, did time or time play in the ancient Greek conceptions of Andrea or manliness? So again, in uh, Homer, that Tima is absolutely crucial to the hero's sense of himself. What he wants above everything else is honor and glory. He wants to be respected and honored by those around him, and that is required for his own sense of self-respect. So it's very much about how you what is your status in the world? How do you feel you count in the world? What do you need to do to get honor? Well, the easiest thing is to do whatever your society already honors. So it can appear that an honor-based ethos at first sight looks as if it might be quite conservative. It might encourage the repetition of established patterns of behavior which have been proven to win honor from your peer group in the past, your society in the past. And that is one of the things that Plato is going to get to grips with. So we have this society based on notions of courage, a particular conception of manliness, which is aimed at honor and excellent behavior preeminently shown on the battlefield. So the the thumos was sort of the driving force that propelled a man to seek exactly. out. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. And sometimes uh, Homer seems to use it to mean something very like boldness or courage itself. Now, later than Homer, but before Plato, so sometime in the middle of the 5th century BC, we get the arrival on the scene of this word Andrea, which literally means manliness. It means the qualities and behaviors um, suitable, appropriate for a man to display. And what is the most important quality for a man to display at this time? Well, the qualities needed for him to perform his main social duty of defending his society and his family in times of war. So your main manly qualities are, again, going to be those which make you effective at fighting back to our physical strength, our skill, our speed, uh, how to use weapons and so on, the knowledge of how to use weapons, but above all, your courage. And as we've seen, this the courage, having courage will require this thumos, this sort of spirited metal, which is the engine force of your courage, which propels you forward. And again, at some point in the fifth century, though Andrea literally means manliness, it came almost to be a a shorthand for courage. And it is the most usual word for courage at this time, which of course means that if you're trying to describe a courageous woman, it's very difficult to do that without calling her manly. And so we've got this very kind of complicated interweaving of ideas. And a lot of the writers before Plato are aware of this and bring out um, these ambiguities in this word Andrea, particularly when they're talking about courageous women, because they can't really do that without making some kind of comment, whether it's favourable wow, look, a woman can be as courageous as a man. We seem to get that in in Herodotus, uh, a historian writing in the middle of the 5th century BC. But we also get um, critiques of women exhibiting Andrea before Plato. Uh, A very famous example would be in the tragic poet 
Sophocles, writing in the 5th century BC in his play Electra, where Electra is trying to avenge the slaughter of her father, Agamemnon, who was slaughtered by her mother's lover, Aegisthus, in league with her mother, Clytemnestra. And Electra is trying to persuade her sister, Chrysothemis, to help her slay Aegisthus to avenge their father, Agamemnon. And Electra says, if we do this, everybody, you know, everybody's going to praise us for our Andrea. And she presumably just means her courage. But Chrysothemis picks up on the root meaning of the word and says, no, 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 it is not appropriate for women to display Andrea. It's not appropriate for women to pick up arms. And so there you get the playwright Sophocles very knowingly and in a very interesting way, um, exploring the ambiguities of this word Andrea. The best word he's got available for courage, but of course, literally meaning manliness. So all those sort of gendered expectations built in. So that's what Plato has inherited. Um, a, a notion of virtue and moral excellence, which is very aligned to particular social roles, particularly as determined by gender and class. And the idea that the preeminent male virtue is going to be courage to such an extent that the word for courage is literally this word Andrea, meaning manliness, and all the consequent ambiguities for what happens when you want to talk about women being courageous. Is, is it appropriate for women to be courageous? That's the really complicated mix of uh, ideas that Plato has inherited. And before we get into how Plato explores these ambiguities with his with his works, particularly in the Republic, um, let's talk about courage more. Because one of the things I love about Greek culture, ancient Greek culture, is that they have these words like thumos that it's a very simple word, but it's a very there's like a, this complex and very rich meaning and it's hard to pin down exactly what they're talking about and i think the same thing goes with courage um you know as you just explained there there's a lot of ambiguity with it i'm curious about the the concept of courage how the the greeks perceived courage it was an honor-based culture and usually in honor-based cultures um, outward displays are more important than internal motivations um was that the, the case with the Greeks? Did internal motivations matter in determining whether you one was courageous or had Andrea? That's such an interesting question. And I, I don't think uh, classical scholars would agree on an answer to that, because certainly at times it looks as if a display of courage in, in Homer, for instance, is, is all about the actions, as you say. It's all about the, the behaviours. And indeed, in, in the plural, ta Andrea, that means your, your daring exploits on a, on a battlefield. However, the Greeks, way back as far as Homer, were very aware that those kind of exploits, those kinds of actions would were much more likely to happen if they stemmed from the right kind of um, emotional drive. So they, I think, my, my view is that they were very interested in the kinds of inner quality, the kinds of psychological quality that were required to bring about these uh, tough actions which were going to which either required the endurance of pain or death or at the very least the risk of enduring pain or death i would say that they're always aware of the importance of a capacity for endurance perseverance this kind of raw spirited metal that we've talked about as being embodied in this concept of thumos so i thought it was interesting too in, in terms of courage and how the greeks uh rated or you know, judge the courage of someone. You talk about this in your book that this idea of techne um, or skill. Now we think of like increasing your skill is awesome. Like it makes you more powerful, more competent. 
But the Greeks thought that if you had increased skill, it actually reduced your ability to uh, claim Andrea in the battlefield. Can you explain the sort of the intersection between of skill and courage for the ancient Greeks? Okay, well, I think it, it varies very much on the writer because there's no question that some uh, hero like Achilles is highly skilled and is also regarded as, as very courageous. So I'm not sure if Homer sees there as being a tension between skill and courage. However, you're absolutely right that there was a debate, and it's particularly picked up in an early dialogue of Plato's called the Lakeys, in which uh, two generals, two old retired generals, are discussing what kind of education is best for a young man and what kind of training is most likely to result in manly, excellent, courageous behavior on the part of the young man. And they particularly ask about this notion of, of skill as a new technique, that a new technique of fighting in armor required for the new kind of battle formation, the new kind of hoplite battle formation, where instead of being on in a chariot or on foot and um, dashing around a battlefield, you stand in line and you hold your post and you protect the, the man on your left and, and your right. And that's a new way of fighting, a non-Homeric way of fighting, which is requiring new kinds of skills. And the skill of fighting in armor is, is preeminent. And there is a really interesting debate about whether it's... But if you fight and are very skilled and that reduces the risk, does that mean that you're less courageous? So the question is, what's the relationship between courage and risk? That's what's really at the heart of the question about the relationship between courage and skill. Is it the case that the more risky the enterprise, the more courageous the action? And certainly Plato raises the possibility that, that no, there is no direct correlation between risk and courage because in certain circumstances, a very risky action might be just utterly hopeless and foolhardy and reckless and not likely to achieve anything positive at all, not even for you know the people you're trying to protect. In which case, taking the risk, how, he, how can that be seen as courageous rather than just reckless stupidity? So Plato wants to make a distinction between courage, uh, which is always good in his mind, and boldness, which could be good or bad. Now, on the other hand, um, if you have no risk whatsoever of suffering any kind of pain or harm, then he would agree that action can't be courageous. You've got to be enduring or risking enduring some kind of suffering for an action to count as courageous. And if you're so skilled that, that it makes the situation completely safe, then that action can't count as courageous. And Plato comes up, I think, with a really interesting uh, solution. I say a solution. He it's an idea that's explored in the dialogue. As ever, he never gives us a very clear answer about what he thinks himself because he wants us to think about these issues for ourselves. And I think he thinks, yes, no risk at all can't be courageous. But if you are skilled, that actually will increase your chances of performing a courageous action in two ways. One, it will make you more likely to enter into the fray in the first place if you know there is a, a reasonable chance you could achieve something good. You may not save your own life, but there's a reasonable chance that you can help protect your, your people. And two, the fact that you're skilled, because it gives you some reasonable hope of achieving some of your aims in the fighting, then that skill is what makes the difference between an act counting as courageous and an act counting as simply reckless 
folly, which is not going to help you or your people or anybody in the in the world. So what Plato does, I think, is say we can train for courage. We can train to make to make it more likely that when the challenge comes, when the crisis calls, when our country calls for us, it will be more likely that we'll take up that challenge. I think the notion that a skill in itself doesn't make you courageous, but a skill can make it more likely that you will act courageously when danger occurs, that there is preparatory work you can do in order to be courageous. I think that's a really interesting idea to explore. That is interesting. So, I mean, getting back to, so we've, we've sort of laid out what manliness um, meant for the ancient Greeks, or the, the Homeric inheritance. Um, it meant courage, it meant seeking honor or glory, and you had this, you were powered by this thumos, this, this spiritedness. Um, why... But at the same time, as we've said earlier, Plato was a little ambivalent about this. And I think you alluded to why, because it was the, the concept of Andrea was it could be applied to women, but how can a woman be manly? I'm sure that kind of confused ancient Greeks. So was that part of the reason why Plato was sort of, he, he felt like these masculine virtues needed to be uh, interrogated more or that he was ambivalent about that he needed to explore further? He's certainly very interested in exploring the gender issues, and I'll come back to that in in a few moments. His first issue is this notion of thumos, this raw drive, which is required for courage. It's the engine room of courage, but left unguided by reason, left to its own devices. It's very, very dangerous. It can take people in good or bad directions. Um, It can give rise to enormous anger and rage and bloodthirstiness, which might be useful if directed against the right enemies, but of course can be hugely damaging if directed against your own uh, side, your own friends or your allies. And in some cases, it might even eat you up. It might be self-directed. So Plato has this dilemma on his hands. He's got this this thumos, this raw drive, which he needs, but he's got to somehow curb it, harness it, uh, utilise its forces for good. And so that's his main uh, aim in the early education section of the Republic, in books two and three of the Republic, when he's laying out an education system for the the young auxiliaries uh, who are going to be the fighting force in his ideally just state. And everything is geared to getting the correct balance in the education of Thumos. So it's toned up enough that it can inspire you to be courageous when needed. So it mustn't be slack, but at the same time, it's got to be uh, something that is uh, answerable to reason, that can be guided by reason, and it can select and understand who the true enemies are and who the true friends are, so it doesn't attack the wrong people. And Plato devises a really interesting mix of physical education, but also what he calls musica, cultural education, not just music, though music is included, but in in literature and the arts generally, uh, to tone down the rougher aspects. And it's at this stage that we um, get him really interrogating the epics of the Iliad and the Odyssey uh, left by Homer and asking questions about the role models in them and whether censorship is needed and whether these role models need reworking for the kind of ideally just state that he's trying to to build. Um, So he's saying, how do we get the energy 
from Thumos without the untrammeled aggression and blood and indiscriminate bloodthirstiness? How do we get the right balance between courage and risk? And he says that his definition of pol what he calls political Andrea, political manliness, by which he means the kind of manliness and courage appropriate within the polis, within the city state, within a civilized context. And he says the aim is to die, D-Y-E, uh, the young trainee soldiers in the correct notions of, of what is and is not to be feared. So, as if you're kind of immersing them in like a, a sort of a, a fleece, immersing a fleece in a vat of dye to colour it. He wants them absolutely impregnated with the correct beliefs about what is and is not to be feared. So they will never think twice. They will just automatically do the right thing. And the only thing that is to be feared is uh, moral shame, moral turpitude and a dishonourable uh, sort of cowardly death. The only thing that is shameful is moral dishonour. And once you realise that physical death isn't to be feared, that physical pain is not to be feared in itself, the only thing that is to be feared is your moral wrongdoing, then Plato thinks you've got the right basis for exhibiting true courage, courage that will be helpful to your community rather than a wild, rash boldness that might sometimes help your community but might often harm it. So it sounds like uh, Plato, like it sounds like the Homeric values are very uh, personal, right? It's all about personal glory. I'm doing this for myself. And it sounds like Plato was trying to take that same energy, that same drive and direct it to the greater good. Is that, would that be a correct statement? I think that's, yes, I think that's a very astute comment. Uh, it is very clear if you read the Iliad that Achilles is very driven by both personal glory, his quest for glory, and also for his love for particular uh, friends such as uh, his beloved Patroclus, who later is portrayed as his lover, though not in, in Homer uh, himself, in Homer, uh, they're very close friends, they're not lovers. But Achilles' motivations, as you say, are always personal. And you do get, there are certainly notions, however, I mean, in Homer, that this is one of the things that Achilles should be critiqued for, that he's not a team player. And when he kind of abandons the battlefield and goes off and sulks in his tent because he feels his uh, leader Agamemnon has not given him sufficient honour, Agamemnon has taken away Achilles' mistress and Achilles takes this as a personal slight. He's not being rewarded for, properly for his courage and he goes off and sulks and refuses to fight for a bit. And you do get um, sort of an embassy of the other Greek fighters go to his tent to try to persuade him to, to rejoin the team. So there, you know, there is certainly a debate in Homer about what your real motivation should be. And Plato certainly expands that debate and, and says, absolutely, you should regard yourself as a part of a greater whole. And there is a passage in the Republic, a, a literally totalitarian passage uh, in which, to summarise, he's sort of trying to get rid of the adjectives I and my and replace them with we and our. And he says that uh, we are all sort of parts of the state as if, you know, we were a finger or a toe in a, in the, as a part of the body. And this is the idea that everything you should do should be ultimately motivated by how it serves your community as a whole. That's how you should see your place in the world. So there are roots of that idea um, in Homer and, and in other earlier writers, but Plato really develops that. And, uh, you know, you mentioned role models were very important to Plato uh, in making his case. So we just mentioned Achilles. I guess Achilles for Plato would be an example of what not to do, 
right? To some extent. I mean, he does, he has this uh, interrogation of and fascination with Achilles throughout much of his early and middle work. And he comes back to Achilles again and again, and he clearly finds Achilles very charismatic and glamorous, as indeed he is. He is the most glamorous of the Greek warriors. And Plato certainly doesn't want to dismiss everything about Achilles. You know, that he just, you know, that embodiment of the life force and vital energy that is Achilles, Plato wants to harness that. But he's certainly very critical of his wild bloodthirstiness of his extremely destructive anger, destructive both to himself and to the other Greek fighters. He's critical of his insubordination, both to his commander Agamemnon and to the gods, because uh, as you remember in the Iliad, Achilles even challenges and uh, lambasts the gods on occasion. He's really um, a real force of nature. And so Plato wants to harness the energy, but to turn it into much more constructive uh, channels. And what he does with Achilles and also with Odysseus, another very famous Greek fighter, famous for his uh, endurance of all sufferings and his ability finally to make it home to Ithaca, but also cunning, wily, untrustworthy. So again, not a perfect role model. And what Plato does with both of those is to rework them and remodel them and keep the best bits and in a way try to put the best bits together into a new model, which is his version of uh, the historical Socrates, who was Plato's mentor and friend, um, who didn't write anything himself, but tramped around Athens discussing philosophy with anybody would listen and quite a few who wouldn't um, and was uh, put to death by the Athenian democracy in 399 BC allegedly for corrupting the young and introducing new gods into the city-state though it was probably more of a, a political show trial and Plato knows he doesn't want to just get rid of Homer and the Homeric role models because he can see people's fascination for them. He knows that the young men he's trying to educate uh, are intrigued by, by them and these heroes. So he wants to utilize that, but he wants to remodel them and rework them. He wants to explore questions about does Andrea, does this manliness and courage, can it only be displayed on a battlefield? Can it not be displayed in peacetime, in civilian life? Could not a philosopher, a thinker, a writer be just as courageous as a military warrior? Is not Socrates um, a paradigm of courage in sticking to his philosophical beliefs all his life? even when eventually he gets put to death for standing up for philosophy. So Plato is trying to extend the field of Andrea, of courage and manliness, into other areas and the military ones. Plato also wants to question whether Andrea courage is specifically male. And his answer there, I think, is quite clear that no, it isn't that women and men exhibit virtues in the same way, and that in terms of virtue, your gender is irrelevant. And there is very good evidence that Plato gets this idea from the historical Socrates himself, that the historical Socrates taught that there is no gen sort of role specificity to to virtue to excellence that it doesn't depend on gender or class or money or anything else it depends entirely on your inner qualities of character and the kind of actions that uh, stem from them so plato is really engaged in this lifelong interrogation of what does it mean to be a real man? What does it mean to be courageous? Are the two inevitably interlinked? Can women be courageous too? 
Plato says, yes, yes, absolutely, because in his ideally just state, there are going to be brave women uh, auxiliaries, or women in the fighting force, and there are going to be uh, philosopher queens as well as philosopher kings, and they're all to display Andrea. And also, as we've seen, Andrea depends on Thumos, this life force, this spirited element, which in Plato becomes formalized into the third part of his tripartite notion of the psyche. So for Plato, the psyche does not just consist of reason and the appetites, but also this third part, the thumos or thumoedes, which is um, a motivational set, if you like, um, of qualities which are aimed at success, honour, glory. It's everything to do with a uh, sense of ourselves, of how we stand in the world. Do others respect us? Do we respect ourselves? A really important motivational set. In fact, we, we've seen it raised a lot in international politics in the last two or three years. Um, people's very deep need to feel that they count for something, that they are heard, they're listened to, that they matter, that they count, that they have status within their society. And we may or may not feel that all the ways that desire manifests itself are helpful. Um, and Plato would have said exactly the same thing, this desire for respect and honour and to feel you count for something can manifest itself in both helpful and unhelpful ways. He would have agreed. However, he would definitely be saying to us this root of, uh, of courage, this, this root of courage is also an absolutely crucial part of human makeup which, yes, has a vital role to play in courage, but in other things too. It is a vital part of what makes us who we are as human beings. And we need to attend to people's deep need for respect and self-respect, as well as our yearning for, uh, for truth um, and understanding, and as well as our desire to satisfy certain physical and material appetites. So all of this uh, Plato is interrogating. So it starts with a question about the nature of Andrea and manliness and courage. And that's a very important conversation in its own right. But that conversation branches out into even broader areas to do with really what is it that makes us human, fully human, what drives us. And Plato is, is, an un, is unusual amongst philosophers in putting this need for honour and respect so centrally into the human makeup. There, there haven't been many philosophers who've done that. Bishop Butler, uh, much later on in the 18th century, but really it's Freud in the 19th century a psychologist rather than a philosopher who works with Plato's psychology and is fascinated by it and to, in, to some degree um, takes Plato's notion of the thumos and reworks it as the, the superego. So how did Plato's interrogation of Andrea, how has that influenced modern Western culture or modern political Western culture? It, well, it started influencing uh, debates very, very early on. So it, including in the ancient world, we get debates um, about whether this new person called Jesus could be regarded as a, a hero or not. And those kinds of debates, I would argue, are influenced by Plato's uh, questioning of the whole notion of what it is to be a hero, what is it to be a role model, what is courage. And then we get this sort of resurgence of interest in the 19th century 
I've mentioned Freud and the way he takes Plato's notion of the thumos and reworks it with, with some significant alterations as the superego and his tripartite ego, superego and id. We get Nietzsche, of course. Now, Nietzsche's a really interesting person in this uh, narrative because Nietzsche kind of says, what he ostensibly says is that he despises Socrates and Plato. He says they're life deniers, unlike Homer, who's a life affirmer. And for Nietzsche, it's all about life affirmation. But actually, Nietzsche is always intrigued um, by the character of Socrates in particular. And Nietzsche is fascinated by Plato's idea that the philosopher, the thinker, um, can show courage, can be a hero. And Nietzsche certainly develops a notion of a philosopher hero in his works, and I suspect saw himself in that light to some extent. Yes, I, I would say that we, we've certainly remained very influenced by Plato's extension of the sphere of courage into areas other than the battlefield. We've at least uh, theoretically remained very um, much persuaded by his notion that the links between courage and its root meaning of manliness need to be disentangled and that women can be as courageous as men. However, I would add that we've never quite uh, got over the original initial sort of links between courage and manliness that we saw in Homer. Um, and if you think about it, um, even after the Greeks, we have the Romans, their word for, for man is vir, and our word virtue and comes from that word. So, and our adjective virile comes from that word. So we, we're still, maybe we don't always realize it, we're still influenced, I think, by the very deep um, European uh, links between certain kinds of courageous virtue and manliness in our thought, not always to uh, our benefit, I would say. But on the whole, Plato has has won the debate to some extent. However, I would say that there is there is a real a real danger, and it's a danger that Plato is very aware of in his dialogues, and I think we're seeing a, a resurgence of it now. So in his critique of different notions of courage and manliness, Plato doesn't just interrogate the heroes in Homer. He also interrogates popular ideals of manliness in his own day, in the fourth century BC, when he was writing. And there are two characters who appear in his dialogues in particular, who I think are unfortunately having a resurgence in popularity now. Not that people may be aware of the connection, but what Plato's talking about is having a resurgence. One is the character of Callicles in a dialogue Plato wrote called the Gorgias. And Callicles gives them, I would say, the most powerful, eloquent and disturbing speech in praise of the theory that might is right, that possibly we have in the whole of Western literature, that uh, power and strength are magnificent that those who are, in his words, more manly, and he uses that phrase many, many times, that those who are more manly and more resourceful and stronger than others, it is right and proper that they should have more material goods and more power, thinks Callicles. Um, he thinks there are naturally lion-like men who should, by rights, rule. He also disturbingly sees democracy as a hindrance to these lion-like men taking their rightful position in the world. He thinks democracy is a terrible idea, which thwarts the ambitions of the naturally strong, and he really doesn't want much truck with it. And his ideal of the strong, resourceful, ruthless man of affairs was very admired in Plato's day. Another proponent of a similar kind of ideal 
is put forward by the character of Thrasymachus in Plato's Republic. And again, Thrasymachus also uh, thinks might is right. He's got a slightly different ideal from Callicles in that for Thrasymachus, the definition of strength is simply whoever does possess political power. If you possess political power, that shows you are strong. Uh, whether you're a democrat, an oligarch, an aristocrat, a monarch, a tyrant, it is simply the possession of power that shows that you're one of the strong. But again, like Callicles, Thrasymachus has this very deep admiration for the ruthless, successful man who is able to do whatever he wants by whatever means he wants and get away with it. Now, Plato takes on both these characters uh, in the Gorgias and the Republic, respectively. He thinks they're his main moral opposition. In, as we've seen with the Homeric heroes, he thinks there's, there are strengths and weaknesses, and he thinks there are some good things about Achilles and Odysseus that he can remodel and incorporate into his new ideal of, of Socrates. But with the ideals of Callicles and Thrasymachus, he thinks it's much more dangerous because he thinks that their heroes really are amoral and are utterly out for themselves, utterly ruthless, utterly unscrupulous, and are also completely happy to lie and deceive others and uh, manipulate people through rhetoric. And I think if Plato were alive now, he would look around the world and he would say, watch out world, because the ideals of Thrasymachus and Callicles are on the rise again, and it is going to be very bad news for society. We need to be very, very alert. We need philosophy, we need to think, we need to use our human power of reason, and we need to harness our spirited energy and our metal for the greater reflective good. I'm curious, why do you, why, what would Plato say? Why, why these ideals of, um, that you were just talking about, why they're back on the rise? What makes them appealing to people? In his own time, they had uh, found favor that, particularly in the last years of the fifth century BC, which were times of great suffering and stress for Athens. There was a very long protracted war with Sparta. There was a disastrous expedition against Sicily in which the Athenians lost heavily in terms of both men and money and honor and respect. Uh, there was a terrible plague in Athens. There were food shortages. So people were under very, very severe stresses. And to a in Plato's eyes, to a large extent, moral society cracked under the strain and did not cope well. And people were yearning for a strong man to come along and sort of a kind of a fantasy of the strong man to come along and sort out their problems and make everything all right again, a kind of magical thinking, if you like. Uh, but Plato's view is that getting a lot of bad people together is not going to bring about good outcomes and that the best thing to do to cope with problems in human existence, whether they're to do with the natural environment or the economy or whatever, is to use our reason to think through our problems, to engage in dialogue and calm courteous, rational debate to recognize the dark side as well as the good side of human nature and to do what we can to harness the good and to dial down, if you like, the bad side uh, in humans. And for him, it would be dialogue, it would be formal and informal education, it would be surrounding ourselves with a healthy, a vibrant culture and it would be an ability to see through 
these allegedly, you know, these self-proclaimed strong leaders and see them for what they are and not be fooled by the very seductive rhetoric because it's not, they are not going to solve our problems. They're in it for themselves. In Plato's view, we have to solve our problems ourselves and not look to mythical strongmen to sort them out. We have to think, we have to talk, and we have to invest in education. Well, Angie, this has been a great conversation. Where can people learn more about your work? So I have um, a, a pretty full website, um, angiehobbs.com, A-N-G-I-E, uh, H-O-B-B-S.com. And that has a lot of links to TV and radio programs that I've made over the years and to a lot of my written material. Uh, I also tweet a lot about what I'm doing and on at Dr. Angie Hobbs. So I have a job in the public understanding of philosophy here in the UK. So a very great deal of my work is in the public sphere. And people can always contact me by Twitter, by email. And uh, I'm happy to uh, continue the dialogue and the conversation. Fantastic. Angie Hobbs, thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure. It's been a huge pleasure. Uh, Thank you so much. I've really enjoyed it. My guest today was Angie Hobbs. She's a professor of philosophy and the author of the book, Plato and the Hero. It's available on Amazon.com. Also, you can find out more about her work at AngieHobbs.com. And also check out our show notes at aom.is slash Hobbs, where you can find links to resources where you can delve deeper into this topic.